I suppose I'm talking at, we've, we've been hearing at sort of high policy level earlier on, but I'm talking uh, from a, almost a worm's eye point of view, from a practitioner's point of view. And I suppose the basic point that I will be trying to make is that people who want to work for justice, equality and social change should bear in mind the possibility of using legal action as one of the methods to do that. And traditionally, people campaigning for economic, social and cultural rights in this jurisdiction would not have turned to the courts uh, for support, except perhaps in very urgent situations to try and stop an eviction or to try and stop the demolition of an ancient monument, uh, as happened occasionally. And there were good reasons for that. The courts had shown a distinct hostility uh, to trying to use the law to enforce such rights. That was spelled out very starkly by then Chief Justice Ronan Keane in a case called TDV Ireland in 2001 when he said that he had, quote, the gravest doubts as to whether the courts at any stage should assume the function of declaring what are today frequently described as socioeconomic rights to be unenumerated rights guaranteed by Article 40 of the Constitution. So there wasn't much doubt where he stood on this issue. And of course, generally, the courts are slow. Uh, legal aid was almost non-existent outside of the areas of criminal and family law. And there was a serious danger of ruinous costs orders being uh, visited against somebody who made an unsuccessful application. So the law was a foreign country and not very welcoming country to most activists on economic, social and cultural rights. And judges were seen as remote, aloof products of elite schools who were divorced from the lives of the poor and disadvantaged people. Now, it's a generalization, a generalization, and like most generalizations, there were exceptions to this, but there weren't very many, actually. Uh, and there was enough truth in the stereotype to make suspicion of the courts a perfectly uh, reasonable position. But things have been a bit different in some other jurisdictions. So in the United States, for instance, uh, there had been a long, first of all, they had a, a tradition of class actions where a lot of people could take an action together, which helped to pay the cost of the action reduced the cost of the action, and also they didn't have the same uh, provisions that we have for, for very heavy costs orders against unsuccessful litigants. But as well as that, bodies like the NAAC, NAACP, uh, the, the senior organization among black people in the United States, and the American Civil Liberties Union, had a long tradition of taking public interest cases in the United States, uh, and that has... Uh, you know, that has continued, and it's, it's a very big part of the American political tradition. The most famous case of all is probably Brown, the Board of Education, which uh, eventually forced the desegregation of public schools in the United States. And in post-apartheid South Africa, where you had a new constitution and you had a new constitutional court, a lot of whose members were lawyers and actually fought against apartheid, uh, there was a much greater interest in, in public interest litigation and there were a number of important cases, notably the Kurtboom case, uh, requiring public authorities to provide accommodation for squatters and homeless people, and the Treatment Action Campaign case, which uh, forced the government to make antiretroviral drugs much more uh, readily available to combat the spread of HIV AIDS. And then in our nearest neighbour, uh, the UK, with a similar legal situation and traditions to us. There has been a striking increase over the last 12 years or so of cases on economic and social rights. And in the paper, I, I mentioned some of them, but I don't have a great deal of time. Uh, they have asserted rights for uh, people, uh, for large family where a mother was severely disabled uh, and was allocated uh, unsatisfactory accommodation by councils, asserting the right the necessity, the obligation upon councils to provide adequate accommodation situations like that. A lot of cases on the rights of gypsies and travellers, which went eventually to the European Court of Human Rights. A case called Limbuela v. the Secretary of State for the, for the Home Secretary, holding that the UK authorities had an obligation to provide at least a sufficient level of social assistance to illegal immigrants to prevent them from starving in the streets. Not a very high standard, but at least establishing that there was a requirement for a minimum standard. Now, the catalyst for the UK courts doing this was the incorporation of the European Convention of Human Rights into British law through the 1998 uh, Human Rights Act. And the European Convention itself, which had been drafted to concentrate on civil and political rights, 
and left economic, social and cultural rights to the much weaker and less well-known European Social Charter. The European Convention has itself been greatly broadened in its scope by innovative interpretations by the European Court of Human Rights, which has now taken decisions on the rights of Roman travellers, the treatment of asylum seekers, right to so social welfare benefits, and so on. And the British courts did begin to absorb some of this jurisprudence and this culture. And that brings us to our own courts. And in this jurisdiction, I think the courts have been influenced by the incorporation of the European Convention, even if it was done in a very half-hearted way. Over a number of years, the courts had failed to protect the rights of travellers in living in dreadful conditions here. However, in two cases in 2007 2008, both called O'Donnell v South Dublin County Council, High Court judges held that the rights under the European Convention of severely disabled travellers living in cramped and unsuitable caravans had been breached. In a number of cases where judgment was given in 2008-2009, High Court judges also held that Section 62 of the Housing Act, which allowed the eviction of council house tenants for alleged antisocial behaviour without any independent appeal mechanism, that that was in breach of the European Convention. And while that might seem to be primarily a procedural issue rather than a substantive one, what the court actually said was that this was in breach of Article 8 of the European Convention, which protects the, the family and the home. And it was effectively saying that Article 8 included the right to secure occupation of your family home. It's so very, very important in, in asserting a uh, right to accommodation. In McCann v. Monaghan District Court, Judge Mary Lafoy, who gave one of the judgments in Traveller cases, one of the judgments in Section 62 case, uh, uh, she held that legislation that allowed a debtor to be imprisoned without legal representation and without even being present in court was unconstitutional. Uh, now, she held that under the Constitution, but Mrs. McCann had also raised her convention rights in her case, and there's very little doubt that the judge's decision was informed or influenced as well by the, the European Convention jurisprudence. And in 2007, the High Court declared that Irish law was incompatible with the European Convention because it failed to make any provision for legal recognition of Lydia Foy, a transgendered woman, in her acquired female gender. I'll come back to that in a minute. And finally, in that sort of area, in 2010, in the case of Meadows v. the Minister for Justice, the Supreme Court changed the very rigid standard required for judicial review of a decision by a public authority. They changed it to include uh, the question of whether the decision was proportionate in the circumstances. And this could potentially make judicial review a much more effective method of challenging administrative action. In, in the past, the threshold to win judicial review was, was really too high for almost all cases. So all this is by way of showing that the attitude of the Irish courts has changed in relation to economic and social rights, especially when they're reflected through the prism of the European Convention uh, and in cases where the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court indicates that if the courts don't find for the applicant in this jurisdiction and it goes to Europe, the European Court will find for the applicant with all the ensuing embarrassment to the Irish state. And there's also European law, European Union law, which has expanded its remit from purely commercial and industrial relations issues to cover a very wide swathe of economic and social rights. Uh, and all these issues in European Union law must now be interpreted compatibly with the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights, which not only replicates the European Convention on Human Rights, but is in a couple of instances stronger than the European Convention. And it is, of course, binding within our courts. So, uh, and in the background to all this are also the European and the UN conventions and covenants, which have a much sharper focus on economic, social, and cultural rights, like the so European Social Charter, the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. Now, constitutionally, these instruments are not justiciable before our courts because they haven't been incorporated. But on the other hand, the Strasbourg Court has increasingly begun to refer to these conventions in the cases it deals with, and under the ECHR Act here, the Irish courts are required to look at and take into account the Strasbourg jurisprudence where it's relevant to the particular case. So times are changing in the legal arena, 
and the, I think that the strategy and tactics of those campaigning for economic, social and cultural rights and for marginalised and disadvantaged groups should change as well. And they should begin to think of incorporating a legal dimension uh, into their overall strategy where appropriate. I want to look briefly at a particular case, which is the Lydia Foy case. Um, and perhaps the first thing I should say about the Lydia Foy case is that it was not a carefully planned strategic campaign. It just, tactic, it just basically developed as we went along, but that there are a lot of lessons we can learn from it as to how to, to run a campaign like that. Lydia Foy is a transgendered woman. She was seeking a new birth certificate and legal recognition in her acquired female gender. When she set out on that journey, there was no transgender lobby or NGO in Ireland to support her. Transgender people were frightened, isolated, and they were in the darkest closet that they could find. So Lydia came to Free Legal Advice Centre's FLAC to help her in 1996. And Flex then solicitor Mary Johnson, very bravely and with a lot of foresight, agreed to take on the case. We took the case to the High Court, did a lot of research, called witnesses, some of the leading transgender experts in, in Europe. There were 14 days of detailed medical and personal evidence, and the judge reserved his judgment. Two years later, it took him two years, in July 2002, he gave his judgment, and he rejected Lydia's application. That was deeply disappointing. But was it a defeat? I don't think so. Because prior to the case, hardly anybody in this country knew anything about transgender people. The 14 days of evidence, which were widely reported in the media, raised awareness about this isolated and excluded group of people. It gave them a human face. And it got across something of the pain and humiliation suffered daily by transgender people. And by an odd coincidence, two days after the judgment here, the European Court of Human Rights gave a judgment against Britain on precisely the same issue and held that they were in breach of the Convention by failing to recognise transgender people. The British, to give them their due, moved fairly fast on it and brought in transgender legislation within two years. In the meantime, the European Convention on Human Rights Act had been brought in here, so now the Convention was part of our domestic law, even though very weak. So we re-entered the case, and this time we relied on the European Convention. We did our homework again. This time we collected jurisprudence about the recognition of transgendered people from Europe, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and generally all around the world. And we argued that Ireland was quite isolated on this issue. But we also produced briefing documents to inform the media about the issue, and we got as much publicity for the case as we could. And the aim there was not so much to influence the court. We aimed to influence the court by six lever arts files of jurisprudence we had collected from around the world. But the publicity we wanted rather to create a climate of public understanding and support which might help the court if it was going to make a, a groundbreaking decision because you know, judges are sometimes reluctant to make what appear to be revolutionary decisions, unless they feel that this is going to be acceptable in the society, in the broader society. And we also knew that there was going to be a need for legislation, and therefore it was important to win popular support for the idea that there should be recognition of transgender people. And this time, Mr. Justice McKechnie found in favour of our client and granted a declaration that Irish law was incompatible with the Convention. Mr. Justice McKechnie was the judge who'd found against her five years earlier, and he had been convinced by the change in other countries. Uh, he'd been convinced that uh, uh, we were left behind on this issue. The state appealed. That could have taken another three or four years to get to a hearing in the Supreme Court. <laughs> no great guarantee what would happen there. But So we were very anxious to try and get the state to withdraw its appeal, which was pointless because the European Court jurisprudence was by then absolutely clear that in several other cases in Europe. So... We began to try and get publicity on that, but in the meantime, important things had happened. A transgender NGO had been set up, Tenny, Transgender Quality Network Ireland. The gay and lesbian community had become interested in the issue and supportive. And bodies like the Irish Human Rights Commission and the Equality Authority were now supporting transgender change. So there was a much wider swathe of people. And we did a lot of work lobbying international human rights bodies like the UN Human Rights Committee, and the Council of Europe Human Rights Commissioner, 
uh, to get them to put pressure on the Irish government to, to do something about this. And meanwhile, the civil society organizations were working. And it worked. The government decided to drop their appeal. They set up a working group to work on legislation to uh, recognize transgendered people. So to that extent, it had been very effective. But on the other hand, today, has Lydia Foy got her new birth certificate? Has the law been changed since she won her case five years ago and the declaration of incompatibility was made? The answer is still no. Is again, this is extremely disappointing and frustrating for Lydia Foy, for the transgender community. But again, is it a defeat? Again, I don't think so. There is now an active transgender NGO. There's strong support in the broader NGO community. They have at their disposal a range of strategies to put further pressure on the government, including the possibility of going back to the courts. And we will do that fairly shortly. Uh, so we have the potentiality there to change. And the law has played a big part in that. There's also a wider point I want to make about Lydia Foy, which is simply that five years after the first declaration of incompatibility under the European Convention on Human Rights Act was granted, nothing has been done. And this inaction really in creates a danger of undermining the whole architecture of the European Convention on Human Rights Act, which was supposed to bring rights protected by the Convention back home so that it could be easily accessed by people in this country. It now appears they can't be, or unless the government acts fairly fact, fast, you can say that this act is a dead letter and people shouldn't bother with it anymore, they should just go straight to Strasbourg. I would hope that the broader NGO community would see the significance of that and would also mobilise behind the FOI case in order to try and ensure that this act is actually effective. So there we are. Long delay, very long delay, but that focuses or it's a reminder of another aspect of public interest litigation. I mentioned at the beginning Brown v. the Board of Education in the United States. Brown v. the Board of Education, the decision was given in 1954. As I grew up in the 1960s and through the 1970s and the 1980s, people were still fighting to desegregate schools in the United States. It has taken a very long time, but that decision was crucial to do it. Groot Boom in South Africa, the struggle to implement the Groot Boom decision and get housing for poor people in South Africa is still going on today. Public interest litigation, public interest law cases, they don't stop when the judgment is given, when the judgment is read out and the judge leaves the courtroom. In many respects, the struggle, or at least a new phase of it, is only beginning at that stage. Maybe that's part of what the conference organizers meant when they chose the subtitle for this talk of giant leaps and baby steps. I didn't really know what this meant, but then I thought about it and I thought maybe the giant leaps are the ringing declarations by the courts which give endorsement and legitimacy to the changes that are being sought. And the baby steps are the long, slow and incremental actions that are needed to implement those grand declarations. And of course, while lawyers can play a part in the implementation phase as well as the taking the cases. Mobilization of civil society actors is usually crucial to pushing the ball over the line. So the two come together and have to work together. In conclusion, I would suggest that there have been significant changes in the legal climate over the last 10 or 15 years in this country that have made the courts more open, though still not enthusiastic, about litigation around economic and social issues especially where they can be brought within the ambit of the European Convention or the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And there are the international and European quasi-judicial bodies where issues can be raised and the government exposed to criticism there. There have been developments in the legal profession with more lawyers working for independent and community law centres and with my colleagues in the Public Interest Law Alliance, PILA, a couple of whom are over here, uh, working to develop a culture of private law firms doing pro bono work for NGOs, something which is commonplace in the United States and South Africa and is growing in Britain but has not been a, a major factor here over the years. I've tried to show how litigation and other types of legal work, making submissions and so on, can advance the cause of marginalised and disadvantaged people and how even unsuccessful cases can sometimes serve to raise awareness about an issue and mobilise support for change. I'd suggest that 
NGOs, community groups and others working for social justice and for an end to marginalisation and exclusion should consider whether there is a legal aspect to their work that could be advanced by litigation or representations to European or UN human rights bodies. And if so, can they build alliances with lawyers who are interested in this area? Equally, lawyers who are keen to use the law to secure economic and social rights for disadvantaged people should seek to work together with NGOs and community groups, learning from the cases that I've mentioned, that success in the courts is rarely enough by itself to bring about significant social change. Working together for both sides may have its difficulties, but each side can learn from the other, and brought together a partnership of civil society and public interest lawyers can achieve a lot. Albie Sachs, the great human rights lawyer and judge of the South African Constitutional Court, gave the Law Society's first annual lecture here in 2005. And talking about the Grootboom case, he said that it showed the extent to which creative lawyers can help the poor to secure their basic rights. I'm sure he would have been happy to add that it also showed the value and power of an alliance between those creative lawyers and civil society organizations. Well, thank you.